when you get to this point, right, I hope you all wrote a line like this. Probably the most obvious thing to do is to divide both sides by two. Uh, but when we meet simultaneous equations, right, you generally have two paths you can go through. You can solve by elimination, right, which is like try and make them look nice and then add or subtract each other. And then there's the other technique. What's the other one? Substitution. Substitution. Now you can probably see here elimination's not going to help you because these two equations are too unalike for you to shape them in that way. But that's okay. That's okay. I can divide both sides by something like, say, A. And now this is an easy thing to substitute in. You can go one better than that and say, I don't even have B in this. I've got a B squared, right? So if you want, you could do that step here, like so. It wouldn't matter. You could do it here or you could do it when you do your substitution. Okay? Now it is really important. If you've gotten to this spot here, uh, you should label what your equations are because they're simultaneous equations. You want to explain what's going on. I'm now going to substitute two, that's this result into here, into one. We want our logic and our argument to be crystal clear. Okay? So rather than just calling this equation two right away, I worked with it. I made it look exactly the way I wanted it before I called it equation two. So now when I do my substitution, I go a squared, there's the first bit, minus that, that's b squared, isn't it? Minus 3 on a squared, which equals, what did we say was equal to? Negative 2. Yep. Okay. Who got to this point and said, uh-oh, <laughs> what do I do with this? Now, now, several of you looked at it, but hopefully tried to press on just to see what would happen. What was the step that you did to get from here? Did you, did you multiply by something? You're like, ah, fractions, gross, okay. You can get rid of the fractions by multiplying by a squared. So you get this. <laughs> and then you're like, oh no, oh no. This is, um, this doesn't look good, right? Stay with me, year 12. Now here's the thing. The four does look intimidating. But it, is, it truly is okay. Because if we just get everything all on the one side, you'll see. You can think of this as something quite easy to factorize. If, for example, instead of being a to the 4, if you had u squared, and if you had instead of a squared, just u, this is just a quadratic. In fact, you can tell me what the factorization is. What's the pair of numbers you're after? Plus 3 minus 1. Plus 3 minus 1. They will add to 2. They will multiply to negative 3. Thumbs up. It's just instead of a out the front, it's going to be a squared. What do we say? Plus 3 minus 1. How's that? Looking okay? Now, um, I could factorize further if I wanted, but you know what? I'm, I'm just going to pause for a moment and just say, what does this mean? If you've got a product between two things and they apparently equal zero, then either one or both of them must be equal zero. Do you agree? Because there's no other way you can get a product of zero. Okay? Now, I could try and make this equal to zero. Okay? But just pause for a moment. Before you start thinking, I can do complex numbers, I know what to do with this, just pause, because what is A again? What is it? A is, A is the real part of my complex number. So it had better not be imaginary itself. Does that make sense? In fact, all the way at the beginning of this topic, we said A and B are defined as real numbers. Otherwise, the real part's not real, and the imaginary part's not imaginary. Okay? So therefore, I can say there is actually no, and you have the right language for this, right? No real solution from this. Okay, no real solution. But this other side does give you a real solution, doesn't it? Clearly, if a squared minus 1 equals 0, a is going to give you plus, minus one. plus or minus 1. And from there, you can go back over here, right? Plus or minus 1. When a is negative 1, b will equal, have a look. This is where I'm substituting into. Minus negative root 3, yes? And when a is 1, then b is going to be positive root 3. Remember, are you okay with that? So I have solutions. Z is equal to, I'll put it back in rectangular form because that's how it was presented to me. Uh, here's my first one. Minus 1 minus root 3i, because that's the imaginary component, um, or the positive version. Okay. Now as promised, this is just one of two methods to do this, right? This was the rectangular way to go about it. Uh, it was, you know, a little circuitous, but it used mathematics that we knew, right? It used simultaneous equations, this comparison, thinking carefully and solving, okay? 
Now, I said to you before, I'm going to leave this as an exercise to you. We can think about this right from the outset, not in rectangular form. But Jia, you said, like, why don't we put this into exponential form? I didn't choose these numbers by accident. I'd like you now, the remainder of this time, you'll have enough time to do this other method. You'll arrive at the same answers. And then you can get on a canvas and have a look at the rest of the exercise. How would you go about doing this in exponential form? I'll give you a clue. You need to start with a number that's written in exponential form, OK? Yeah. Mrs. Lees. Just before we head on, um, I know that a lot of you wrote plus or minus your answer. In this case, that's OK. But sometimes the positive A is going to go with the negative B. And you need to really make it clear which your partnership is. So if you just always go, oh yeah, plus minus one, plus minus root three, make sure you know which way round they go, because they don't always go plus, plus, minus, minus. Oh, yeah, so I okay. just want you to be super careful, and that's why laying it out and laying it out makes that abundantly clear. As this is these point out, I very deliberately, even the mathematicians are famously lazy, we also have a big thing about communicating clearly and unambiguously, right? Now, sometimes you will see, in fact, I think one version of the reference sheet in the past actually used this notation, which is exactly what Mrs. Leaves was just talking about, when the plus minus of one matches with the opposite sign of the other one. This notation is used, you'll sometimes see it. I'm just gonna go out there and say, I don't like it, because people look and they're like, what the heck does that mean? You, you come up with it so infrequently that comparing that to something like this, where I just write my signs properly, this just wins hands down. And it, you know, if, if you really want to roll the dice, you might meet some HSC mark and be like, what on earth is that? And then tough, that was the only HSC mark you got and you never find out, okay? So this is definitely the clearest unambiguous way to do it. So for those of you who didn't get there, just let me walk you through the way I've thought about this, okay? To do this in exponential form, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing you gotta do is get the complex number provided to you written in exponential form rather than rectangular. So you can see that uh, over here on the top right hand corner, I had to find my modulus, had to find my argument. Um, some of you who I showed this to earlier said, like, do we have to have a diagram? The answer is, the question did not ask for a diagram, but I find it so helpful when working out what my modulus and argument are, particularly the argument, because I'm like, I don't know, is it negative? Like, which is the principal one? Um, it just seems to me so much of an easy way to think about it uh, that I, I often draw a diagram, even when it's not required of me. It is a very, very convincing argument for the marker and for you as well. Once you've got that, you can see I've rewritten Z as 4e to the i 2 pi on 3. And then from there, it's almost like that form of number was designed to make questions like this easy to deal with, right? You can see I've, I think I, use, I don't know why I used W instead of Z, maybe because I was separating my working out, but um, you can see I've just factorized using difference of squares. Do you see my line there? W squared equals 4e to the etc. right? So then you've got, it's something squared take away something else squared. You just have to rewrite it in a form, which is what I've done on this third last line to show what's being squared. To get 4, you square 2. With the indices, to get to 2 pi on 3, because it's being doubled, you halve it, right? So that's why it's pi on 3 on the inside, and you multiply by 2. Um, from there, you can see my factorization. And then here is my answer. Now, unlike in rectangular form, it does make sense to just put the plus minus out the front. It's completely unambiguous what that means, OK? So this is a more concise way to write it. But I do want to point out it works nicely because of the particular complex number I handed you. It's got a nice argument. If I gave you a number, which the exercise frequently will, which has a weird non-exact value, like what's the angle in my 6, 8, 10 triangle? I don't know. Okay, So if you've got a number like that, use the rectangular form. That's totally fine. But the whole point is we have access to these tools. And part of the skill set we want you to develop is which one is the most appropriate and pick the right one. Make sense? Exercise 1B, uh, make sure you have a look at the questions that are in the calendar. I know a bunch of you have submitted questions to me, and I'll work on them to send to you guys on the page. Mrs. Lees. Would you like to specify what's meant by inspection method? <laughs> OK. So by inspection is an extension to students' favorite phrase. It basically means I looked at it, and my brain told me the answer was this. Now, you've actually been doing this for quite some time. For example, you did it right here. Do you see that? 
You're like, oh, this was me looking at this and realizing I know these numbers sufficiently well to just say the pair of, like, I didn't, like, I, there was not a big argument of, of logic of, like, how do I get from here to here, okay? Now, when they say by inspection, they're asking, like, they're handing you a number that should be easy, like, this is a bit of a messy number, right? It's a number that you're going to be able to say, if I think about where the modulus is and where the argument is, I can halve the argument because then you double it to get to there, and I take the square root of whatever the modulus is, because you can see that's how I get from, uh, what do we say? Modulus of four to a modulus of two. Right? That's what happens when you take the square root of the modulus. So that's only for numbers that are nice and easy, which is why the textbook on that question gives you convenient ones. For the rest of them, you're gonna have to bring out the big guns, okay? Thank you, year 12. <laughs>